Hi, Greg Finnegan here. And David Vizard. And you guys are watching PowerTech 10. We're here today dynoing this engine. This engine is for the Classic Rivals Contest, uh, which is part of Race Engine Challenge. We have dynoed this engine uh, previously, and we're a little disappointed as to where the, uh, the torque curve has ended up. So we plan on uh, playing with some different exhaust lengths, headers, primarily the secondary uh, headers, and then we're going to try some tri-y exhaust headers to especially see if we get the torque peak or the amount of torque that the engine is producing just seems, doesn't seem to be up to par. I think I should say at this point that even though there's still several things we need to sort out on this engine, it is still a viable test engine to see what may work better than what we have now. We're taking into account that we don't have the compression pressure here, but we're treating that as a separate problematic symptom. So, back to Greg. We started with this engine from the very beginning, uh, putting these parts together. Uh, on this engine, there were certain parts that we already had. We had the block, dark little end block, AFR 235 heads, the intake manifold, um, oil pan, so we decided in this contest, since we uh, had those parts, that's what we went to run with. The last time we ran the engine on the dyno and we did a static compression check, we were very disappointed at what, what we were seeing on that uh, static compression check. It was only 165, 170. We thought that was a bit low considering it's 11 to 1 compression ratio on this engine. Here's what we have planned for today. Right now on the engine, we have uh, four to one exhaust headers. They're one and seven eighths to two inch, three inch collector. What we're going to do is we're going to incrementally put longer secondary uh, secondary runners on that. We can go. We're going to add one foot, two foot, and we have a anti reversion. I guess you'd call it a diode in an exhaust system, prevents backflow or pressure waves going the wrong way. After that, we're going to look at the potential of using tri-wide headers on the engine. When we put a different exhaust on, it might not have the O2 bungs uh, in the header. So if you don't have a, a weld shop next door, especially a TIG welder, it's very difficult to play with different exhaust combinations. And here's an example right here where we put in two O2 bones, which will be attached to the different headers we try. So far, we've been testing with these headers that you see on the engine here. These are the ones we just tried with the secondary, different secondary lengths. The next stop is something I think you're all going to be interested in, and that is. We're going to try what is commonly called tri-y exhaust headers next time. Now these, in quotes, tri-y's, are the same design as I had on my cup car, which this type was very popular back in the early 2000s. We've got a couple of sets of these in different sizes, and, oh, by the way, you like to finish on this? For coating like this, we use our local coating place, which has been in business a long time now. I'll run their name across the bottom here. But, as you can see, it looks a very pretty exhaust. Anyway, this will be the next item we will use for length testing. What we're going to look at here is Greg just changing the length of the pipes by four inches with the aid of an anti-reversion extension. So we'll see what this somewhat different way of boosting power really looks like in practice. Okay Greg, we've got to check this done so. Okay fellas, we're ready to fire up.
here's our baseline. Runs pretty consistent. Now we're going to change the pipe extension from one about nine inches long to about a foot. Okay, time for a brief sales pitch. Got this big block Chevy cam. It's got about 10, mi <clears throat> 10 minutes of running on it. I was going to say 10 miles. It's a hydraulic roller on a 108 load center line. I'm reading it off from here. Uh, with one seven rockers, and we use one eights with it. It's with one seven, it's 622 on the intake, 617 on the exhaust. The 50 duration is 242, 248. It's a midline aggressive and it's about, and it's about 290, 296 at 6,000 slash for a hydraulic roller. <clears throat> it is ideal, not nearly ideal, but ideal for a hot street 496 502 uh, with a 10.5 to 1 compression. When we dynoed this, we made a solid 1.4 foot pounds per cube with it. And horsepower was somewhere hovering around 700. Streetable still. This would cost you 390 odd bucks at Jags or Summit. My price for this, and it's custom grind, 225 plus shipping. That'd be probably about 50 bucks. So, if you want this, call between 4 and 7 on virtually any day of the week. That's 4 in the afternoon to 7 in the afternoon, Charlotte time, on 704-675-4447. Only sales calls on that line. No tech calls whatsoever. Do not call unless you are serious. Thank you. <clears throat> and now back to our regular programming. My theory is, is that if we're going to use an anti-reversion device anywhere in the exhaust system, the very best place to use it is as close to the manifold face as possible, i.e. actually at the manifold face. I did quite a bit of anti-reversion testing in England a long time ago. and One of the things I found was that on four-cylinder engines, anything on the header was... Uh, barely effectual. Now, it was interesting to see that there were quite a few people who swore by these anti-reversion collectors. Well, we did try one at the end of a tailpipe about three feet long. We tried one at, in the middle and we tried one at the end and we tried one just on the end of the collector. So it was only about a foot long. I'm not going, neither Greg nor I are going to 
bore you with repetitious stuff here. We've done that before. Thank you. We've done enough of that. But here's what we found. Sure, the anti-reversion uh, deal, and I'll put a sketch in of this, actually did work. Not a great amount, but it's almost zero cost mod. And it did work consistently, but only to a small amount. Now, here's the um, uh, some of the uh, power curves we got. You will see that regardless of where we put it, it produced virtually the same result. The curves virtually overlaid within a width of the line. So, let's take a look at those curves and see what gives. What you're seeing here is a typical difference between the AR collector extension and no AR collector extension. The curves look pretty much the same regardless of the length of the pipe that was finally used. So, summing up from these results, at least, we can say a collector right on the end of the pipe is only worth a small amount. And who knows, it may change a cam or something like this and it may resonate at some different frequency or who, who knows. So, at this point in time, an anti-reversion collector is something that you might want to try at the track, but you're only going to pick up, at most, maybe the odd couple of thousands. As you can see from these curves, we are, in terms of finding extra power on what we initially found, fighting a losing battle with endless dyno tests. So, here's the result. Yes, a cone at the back or anywhere in the system works, but only to a limited amount. Now, all of this took up so much time that we ran out of the time in the day to actually run our cup car headers. So you're going to have to take it here and the cup car headers will be the next in the list. Now, what we're going to do next is more anti-reversion tests, but with a twist. Instead of just doing a test, we are going to find out why and how it works. That's what we're going to do with our in-cylinder pressure measuring gear. But that's for another day. So, at this point, I can say that Greg and I thank you for watching, and we'll see you on the next video, which will be shortly.